thank you all for showing up. Uh, I'm pretty excited today by, uh, by giving this talk, and I get to say this because it's, I'll not be talking for most of the time. We have uh, seven wonderful speakers, designers here, who will present small bits and pieces from some of their games. And I'm pretty excited about some of the design stuff that is, will be in these talks, so I hope you are too. Thank you all for showing up. My name is Søren Eberhøj. Um, I'm an engineer, and I will be talking a little about design here in the beginning before uh, the rest of the speakers come on. Um, yeah, so the format is, I give a short introduction, and we'll have seven speakers. Um, there won't be time for questions in between, so I would uh, ask the speakers to stay in the room for a few minutes afterwards for the rest of you to catch up on questions, if you need that. Yeah, okay, first, I will try to say a little about design. Um, I hope you heard Johanna Kolyanen's presentation yesterday, and there will be one by Bjarke Peterson this afternoon, um, which I think will sort of go deeper into this, because I don't have a whole lot of time for this. But first, a definition. Um, to, to design something is to create a plan um, or a convention for the construction of an object a system of measurable human or a system system of measurable human interaction. So this refers to sort of the process of figuring out how to construct something that will solve a problem. And further, um, a design is the specification of an object manifested by an agent intended to accomplish goals in a particular environment using a set of primitive components <coughs> satisfying a set of requirements subject to constraints. Well. <laughs> this gets a little complicated, right? It's sort of very formal, a, a very formal definition, and it points towards very sort of formalized design processes that are very targeted and rational and, and stuff. But, and I'm completely messing up my point here, but I'll, I'll look into my notes for a moment, sorry. Um, yeah, okay. So, as an engineer, the, the most important parts of, of this, I think, is the part about accomplishing goals in specific environments and the part about additional sort of requirements and constraints for the solution that, that we're trying to, to do. Um, so starting out a design process should start with um, formulating a design problem. What is the goal that we want to achieve with this particular solution, um, in which environment will, this, will the solution work, and which requirements are there for the design solution. Um, these sort of types of definitions are very formal, and, and also design processes tend to be viewed, at least in my field, as very formal and well-structured and, and rational processes. Of course, they're not in reality, and you probably know this. Um, design process are, processes are weird things happening and it takes a lot of intuition, usually a lot of uh, um, creativity and also a lot of experience. So, but, but when I sort of, when I like these definitions anyway, I think it's because they highlight some of the things that I, that I think about as very important in design. Um, and I think I should change my slide again. Maybe? Yeah, okay. So, it's about figuring out how to solve a problem um, or to achieve a specific goal. So we put wheels on the bike because we want the bike to move, right? Not because it's cool, because we usually do that. Um, but also, the science of work in one, one environment or in one game doesn't necessarily work in other environments. And, and I think this is probably obvious, right? But, but I learned that the hard way, I think. Um, so so the, the bike is pretty good for moving around in a city, in Denmark at least, where it's flat, but it's not very good in two feet of snow. So instead we put tracks on the bike um, and a motor and it turns into a snowmobile, right? Um, and also there may be other requirements and constraints, so if the user of the bike needs a little help, we can stick a small electrical motor on it and a battery and, and it will speed things along. So what I, yeah, and <laughs> I think the last thing I would, I would like to point out here is, uh, is a quote from Johanna Collin, and I heard it, well, yesterday, and I, heard, I hope you did too, but also I heard it the first time last year, and it sort of stuck with me that the opposite of design is tradition. And of course, there's a lot of caveats and, 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 and things to this, but, but you probably also, all, all of you know campaigns or, or groups of organizers that have been running for 
for some time, where a lot of the stuff that is going on in the games are as it is, because of that's how they've always done, or well, that's how we do it around here. You probably recognize this from a lot of your own things as well, I guess, at least I do. Um, and and why, the reason why I'm pointing this out is that when we do that, when we make choices uh, based on tradition or sort of intuition, which is totally fine, we, we lose the possibility of figuring out what is it that we're actually trying to solve here in which environment is it going on and which constraints are there. So we lose the possibility to design something and, and, and we run the risk of not making the right choices. So the things that I'm trying to do with these uh, talks here is to, of course, show, showcase some nice design elements from games, but also to sort of shine a light on the thoughts that led to those decisions being made and why those decisions were made. Okay. Before we go to the first speaker, I will give my own sort of first little presentation here about uh, a game called The White War. The White War was a game set, uh, or it was an analogy of the war in Iraq, so we had some occupiers and uh, local people. Um, one of the design problems that we tackled was that we had this very sort of skewed power structure and we wanted that to even out a bit. It had to take place in a game where the soldiers had all the power, they had all the weapons. Um, and it also required, or there was the further constraint that all player, all characters were players. So we couldn't just instruct the soldiers like uh, we, you can with NPCs. And the thing that we thought we would do was we'll make the locals feel home in the game and we will make the soldier, soldiers feel alien and stand out. And we did that sort of in, in various ways. First of all is the costumes. As you can see, the, the soldiers look a little like, like sort of Western military personnel um, with bulky body armor and a lot of weapons and gear strapped to their bodies. So this gets bulky, gets heavy, it's not very comfortable to wear, um, and it gets warm. The locals, on the other hand, um, were sort of wearing loose fitting garments, skirts, stuff like that, so it would be nice and, and comfortable for them to move around in the, in the setting. And onto the setting, um, the locals had sort of most of their everyday life in this huge open tent. Um, and we did a, a, a lot of things with this to make the soldiers not feel at home here. Um, we would hang stuff from the ceiling to block line of sight. There would be stuff that they could get entangled in. Um, there would be herbs and spices hanging down to, uh, to create smells for the soldiers to sort of experience and have this sort of sensory overload. Also, all furniture was very low, so the local people in their loose-fitting garments could be lounging around, whereas the soldiers, if they tried to make a sort of polite and real interaction, they had to sit down and crouch with all their heavy gear, so just for the soldiers, being here was uncomfortable. And the last thing, which was not by design, but pretty lucky, was that we had a heat wave. Um, <laughs> and since this, this took place in a chalk quarry, you can probably imagine white dust being everywhere, and, and if, especially the soldiers with all the gear feel, feeling extremely hot. And you can probably realize how this shifts the power dynamics between these two uh, player groups with all these things that actually has nothing to do with power, power dynamics. Okay, so that was my talk. The next speaker will be Mia Hexman, uh, talking about uh, the rules of magic from Cotton. The rules of magic. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the meta design system that we created for the LARP Coven. Um, and Coven uh, was a LARP about witches. So they had to have powers. The problem we had with that was that we didn't want to do uh, powers that were just um, any, anything or like that were just uh, directly uh, relevant on the player. So the player could just say anything and then the other player would do anything. We wanted to create um, powers that felt like they were real, like they felt like they came from somewhere and they felt like there was rules behind them and that they worked in the world and that you had to understand how they worked um, for that. Uh, and of course we immediately realized that that was so stupid because that meant that people would have to learn it and that meant that they would have to, uh, these powers would have to be intuitive, they would have to be fun, they would have to be hackable, they couldn't just break the minute you tried to use them. Um, they had to be playable, they had to give something. Uh, we wanted them to actually be relevant to each player. They wanted to feel individual, important to each player, and of course, immersive. 
uh, the solution that we came up with was uh, this little system here. <laughs> so we basically came up with dividing it up into different stages that we're going to do <coughs> simple and intuitive to understand the for the player. Um, we have a meta word. Um, we have eye contact uh, for most of them, touching for others, so that uh, consent was also involved in the actual process. If you didn't want it, then you would just look away or remove the touch. Um, we had five powers that you would, did have to learn, but that should be understandable actual name. And then we actually had instructions, and all of this was part of the actual game, uh, that you could hear it in the game, that uh, it wasn't, uh, all of it wasn't meta, it was a mix. This is also the, we had the primary powers, secondary powers, rogue, um, and that was so that you could combine the powers as well to make it more fun to play with other people who had other powers, and actually important to do so in most cases. Um, there's an example on the homepage that you can look at. This is a breakdown of it, but it will take a little while to go through. So the result. Uh, we had to do a lot of pre-prep. We probably over-prepped. We freaked out a little. So we made videos and we made a, a pamphlet and we put that up all over the, the place, like in the bathrooms. Um, we wrote, obviously we had it on the homepage. We basically had like seven steps of uh, cramming it into players, including at the workshops, intensively workshopping them again and having characters at the LARP uh, teaching them again. Um, that in hindsight wasn't needed, but uh, I, uh, the players were a bit nervous because I don't think that this happens so often in LARPs when someone says there's five powers and you have to learn them all. Uh, and that also resulted in, it was a slow start, people were nervous. The first few hours people were nervous, uh, and then it just <coughs> exploded. People just went crazy with it, and they did hack it, which was exactly what we wanted. They hacked it a lot, and it worked. Um, yay. <coughs> And we actually did get, um, from the very nervous start of it, we got a lot of positive feedback in the end on it, that it was uh, a functioning and fun system. So yes, and if you want to know more about it, then there's more information on the homepage, and uh, these are the people that helped make this system. Is that it? <laughs> Thank you, Mia. Next up is Stine Du from Denmark um, with a talk ESR, the game in the game. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have a slide? Yeah. Well, as I said, I'm going to talk about the ESR, the game in the game. Sometimes at the, the labs we do in Denmark, we need uh, something you, don't ca you can't get in the game. Like uh, at the uh, Miami Vice, we had a Miami Vice lab just a few weeks before here. Yeah? And you can't have a whole city at a school. You can't get every location you would want to go to at the same place. So we need to have some kind of a box to do this in. We call this an e uh, ESR. Why, why do we call it as an ESR? Uh, event simulating room was the shop for this you have. Sometimes we have the, the combat eight uh, stages, the places where you can go for just buffing up and getting in combat with each other. We know this and we know the black mushroom, we go to cry, we go to have feelings. <laughs> we didn't really want to use any of these expressions for this because people were not going uh, only for these experiences. So we made a, a new word, uh, we use, use it in our labs. And I'm going to show you a few pictures from some of the labs and some of the situations you can experience we can do this. And I'm also going to say something about how you can do this uh, as an organizer afterwards. Yeah? This is from the sample labs. We had three sample labs in Denmark. Um, this is actually the ESR room. This is outside. This is in the forest, a place in the forest where we need to have uh, people go out with food. They, uh, somebody brought a fishing stick. We can get some fishing equipment. We could put out traps, or they can put out traps to players, and we'll uh, bait the trap with things. And you go out in the season of forest, get blood, get uh, excitement, get fun. A lot of things you can get from the ESR rooms or the areas we have here. It doesn't have to be a single room. This is actually a single <coughs> room with the, in our 50s sci fi lab. It's from the second one, Ring of Saturn. Set up here was uh, we needed a planet with a mining station. Some uh, players needed to go out and do some uh, work at this place to get more voters for the president. They need to set this room up. And the uh, setup was to have angry workers. 
are not getting uh, paid enough, enough healthcare, which was the stage. They need to, to figure this out in the game, how to deal with this. <coughs> Last uh, lab we did was a uh, manualized lab. These are totally different situations. Same room, same physical room, set up uh, different locations. Uh, we had a speed dating process. 22 players signed up for this. Totally volunteer, not our game. We had a date on the beach. We had like an assault in the harbor. You have to have an assault in the harbor in the Miami Vice Lab. <laughs> we had an art gallery because some of the players actually wanted to, to steal some art and told us they wanted to do this. Yeah, we can do this. We can set this up. Please come. And we had a wellness center just for, for the kicks of it, just for, for fun. It's part of setting. How do I do this as an organizer? We. Uh, it's like, like a, a booking system in, in this. We, uh, we have a list in the bunker, and we have a room, of course, and we say to the players when they come and say, could, could I have this? Could I go to a uh, dump and steal a generator? Yeah, yeah, come in half an hour. We have set it up for you. We need uh, plastic re uh, reusable resources, every kind of thing uh, you can use, tables, whatever, set them up different ways. This is very low-key labs, and people would go with this. If you're really, really great, you have uh, sound effects, or you have pictures or lights and things also don't have to have it, but it's very great. It, it just makes it better. And the most important thing you need to have are very creative and good NPC team to help you set these up and do the parts in this. So, and good communication also. Thank you. Um, is the mic loud enough? Yeah, okay. Um, next up is uh, Sus Mutsas. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> With a talk on uh, net escape from Dotspor. Dotspor, yes, excellent. Okay. <laughs> How does this. Uh... Yeah, just... Yes. So um, I'm part of a uh, event called Dotspor, translated as Dead End which is a modern-day horror campaign. It's been running for six years. It's kind of an heirloom. <coughs> None of the or original organizers are still on the team. Um, and we will be ending it next year after nine events. Um, players are a government task force investigating paranormal activity for the Dutch uh, government. Um, we were faced with a challenge this time because we have a, a group of players who play hackers. Um, and some of them are actually IT guys, and none of us crew members are actually IT guys. So we built this really cool app for them two events ago, and they broke it. And then we built this another cool app, and they went into the code and broke it. <laughs> so this time we were like, we're doing something else. Also, we really wanted to take the players away from their laptop, as we allow them to use Wikipedia. It's part of the game. You can go on Wikipedia, you can look up the plot, and players will come and be like, is this real? It's like, yeah, yeah, use it, go ahead. It will probably work. Um, so, um, we wanted to get them away from their computers and actually start communicating and making it a social uh, skill. Which is why we designed them an escape room. They um, were invited by uh, sprites of the internet to physically go into the servers of, a, uh, of the end boss, the big bad guy, <laughs> hack in there and steal his files. Um, so we built a uh, escape room in an existing library that our location has. Um, we built a soundscape for it, added light design, um, added like groups of six players at a time. It took 30 minutes for a group of players to play through the thing. Um, and instead of actually needing to escape, they were supposed to gather small fishes with uh, numbers on them, which were bits and bytes, and they could use them to buy files. So that was the download capacity you would get. So the better you'd be do, the more files you would get at the end. Um, the effect was that the players finally came uh, away from their computer, started sharing information, started communicating, started working together because everybody wanted to get the most bytes. So afterwards they were like, how much did you get? How much files did you get? Was it important enough? And they built this massive police investigative board with all the connection lines and all the files taped on it and suddenly the plot we've been working on for seven years came together. <laughs> <laughs> we were quite happy. Um, yeah, um, good and bad things. Well, it takes forever to build it, to make it actually work, to test it. We tested it at the event with a group of NPCs. Um, 
which was God sent. Also, um, it takes two organizers to reset the game every time. And it's just manpower for the win. Also, practical things like locks that don't close or locks that get screwed up have backups of everything. The good players actually shared. Everybody who wanted got involved. Everybody got to play. People loved it. And the second they walked in, there was this wow effect. And people like really felt the pressure of the room. So um, they were excited because they actually got to play and puzzle and um, take something out of it. And not break it, which made us very happy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> so, next up is uh, Anna Emilie Ort from Denmark, um, talking about the perfect overanalyzed SMS conversation from a game called Settled. Yes. <laughs> you? Yes. Um, so, <laughs> I wanted to uh, kind of change a really annoying situation on not understanding each other over SMS text into a fun and interactive <coughs> thing. Um, this was in relation to a lab I created with Duisa Meyer uh, about uh, romantic relationships and heteronormative norms. So we have this well-established couple and they of course have to go through different uh, everyday scenes and in that is the SMS conversation. Uh, everyone either plays uh, the man part, so we have like five, character, five players playing the man character uh, and the other five playing the female character. And this is gender blend, blend uh, all over the place. So that's nice. Um, yeah. So the lab really wanted to expose the uh, heteronormative structures through humor. So not getting too upset or sad, but actually laughing our way to understanding. So that was part of the setup. Um, yeah. So, the misunderstanding mis SMS conversation. See. This is my new favorite tool, by the way. Uh, this is an overhead projector. It's, it gets you to be the most uh, annoying lab designer when you sign up for black box conventions because no one knows where to get it. It's old. <laughs> but it's actually an amazing tool. Uh, <laughs> And we wanted to use this to make a scene uh, with uh, planning dinner. Like a Tuesday afternoon, you're at work, and you want to actually get to plan how, what, what we're going to do for dinner in this couple. Uh, we wanted to turn it over, so it was the uh, understanding and the feelings and the subtext of the SMS conversation that actually got out and was the important part. Um, and also, we wanted to make uh, the misunderstanding fun, as said earlier. And another design issue was to make it visible for everyone and to make the sending option a part of uh, a physical act. So you actually, because there were so many players playing the same character, it was uh, important for us to know when you, actually, oops, when you actually send the SMS that was going to be misunderstood. So we did this. We had the overhead projector in the middle, and then the groups sending it by actually putting the texts on looking like this. <laughs> so, of course, this is uh, heteronormative, so we have red woman text and the, the blue uh, male text. And we actually got a really nice visual setup. Um, so, the sending favorite function worked, and uh, without needing to get specific instructions, we actually got them to build in uh, a really nice effect with um, talking to each other about what the SMS um, meant and also actively misunderstanding each other because you could hear it. So if the woman said, well, um, right, hi, honey, I miss you, the man could be like, oh God, I'm not going to have sex tonight <laughs> and talk about that and then reply, oh, I miss you too, and then the women player could discuss about why he didn't write that like five minutes earlier, so she had, didn't have to write the first SMS. And that was really nice. Um, so, visualization is really key in this. Built-in monologues, 
the design was actually really good at exposing the um, the talk about the SMS and how to misunderstanding. And then it actually created a cooperation between the players that was really nice. And it evolved into something much bigger than we expected and was actually the most fun scene and the best scene in this lab. Yeah, so if you want to know more, just come and talk. Also about getting overhead protectors. I know where to get them. <laughs> Thank you. That's good to know, I guess. <laughs> so next up is uh, Simon Svensson, right there, um, with his talk about essence and nihil, maybe, um, from the Ukraine stream. Yes. Hello. Yes, so I'm talking about a concept called essence and nihil. And it was spawned from uh, a need to write characters differently. And uh, we wanted something that would, in the writing itself, push people to interact differently with each other. We felt that the normal dark side, light side and so on that exists in many characters was a too internal process. That many got stuck knowing, not really knowing where to go or how to interpret it. So we wanted to write the characters where the pushing and prodding on each other and, and, and like uh, affecting each other's relations was part of the design. <coughs> so we made this by doing essence and nihil. And the idea was that everyone was someone's essence. You had a person written into your character sheet that it said that for this person you are the hope, you are the dream or someone who lifts them up when everything is dark. You are responsible for seeking out this player in the game and trying to make them believe in themselves, believe in something good and so on. And uh, it could either be what you represented to them. You represent a family member, but you're just a friend or something like that. Or you could just, in your relation, have that kind of role. Then you were also someone's nihil. You were responsible for seeking them out and trying to break them or make them feel bad or, you know, really push them down into the dirt, literally or figuratively. Uh, you would make them feel horrible and, uh, in the end, give up on everything. And then you had two other people who were yours, that would seek you out, so you did not have the same. So you essentially had a light side and a dark side built into your character, that someone else would be your dark side, someone else would be your light side, and ensure interaction between characters. So what this does is, it, it ensures interaction. It ties everyone in the LARP in a giant extended web, so each action will cause a reaction in the player, who then can use that and push the next person, and so on. And it gives you a clear responsibility as a player for seeking people out. You don't need to find internal motivations like, ah, oh, should I really be mean to this person? Yes, you should be mean to this person. <laughs> Clearly, and be mean to someone else while you're, while you're at it. Uh, but there are, of course, challenges to this system, as we also found. That was the first experimental way of doing it. First, there's always a, you, you might not have chemistry with a player that you are assigned to. Uh, and we wanted to have this system as a responsibility for that very reason. Even if it didn't work out, you could at least give someone one or two scenes. But there was a bigger problem, and it was, in this game at least, you were sort of forced out of your way. If that person was located physically or like geographically in a place where you didn't have a reason to go, it would be much, much harder to seek them out. So. Uh, if you didn't have any natural connection point in the story that you were following, that you had felt like inspired by, then it became difficult to find this person. So, if you're going to use it, make sure that it's really that you think about the spatial design of the game that you're, you have, so that not only do they want to seek this person out, they want to push them down and pull them up from their despair, but they can actually do it in the room and in the story that you have. And this is just one of the many design elements that we had. Uh, and uh, we will be speaking more about it at 6.15 today, where we'll go through the entire design process of the game. So uh, thank you, and I hope it will help you at some point. <laughs> thank you. So for the next one, there will be a little tech stuff going on first. Well, it's not that difficult, maybe.
Yeah, so next up is Martina Svendvik with the... Uh, I forgot your talk That's now, okay. sorry. That's okay. Uh, I called it skip a beat. Uh, it's... How do I do this? No? <coughs> There we go. So uh, the name of the LARP was Cal 5 Spin Off to Hell and Back. And it was a very small game for a bunch of people who played Cal 5, made by uh, Aina Schoenskjell, Charlie Ashby, Ingrid Studer, and me. Uh, and we wanted this game to be darker than the normal <coughs> Cal game, even darker. Yes. <laughs> um, and we wanted to, to experiment with horror elements. And we, did, we used several horror, horror elements in this game. Um, we had a kind of gross out thing where we hid pig's hearts that were supposed to be demon hearts throughout the house. Uh, and as you can see, there was yeah, some blood, some horror going on. Uh, but in addition to dragging people physically into hell, uh, and in addition to uh, sending them dreams that would freak them out based on what they told us they were afraid of, um, we also wanted a sense of stress uh, and intensity to go on throughout the game. And in order to do that, we, we wanted to use sound. And now I need help. How do I put the sound on? I thought it actually was on. Yes. And now it's at full max volume, just so you know. Uh-oh. <laughs> So this uh, is what we came up with. On day two, uh, we got Stoll to, to start the sound downstairs. And we wanted this to just go and go and go for 12 hours throughout the second day until they found the two hearts that we'd hidden throughout the house. Uh, but we couldn't actually find a long enough heartbeat. So we figured, OK, well, we'll just loop it. And It'll be fine, nobody will notice. Uh, and the way it goes now, right, you might not actually notice how intense this sound will be because it just goes in the background. It's called slow, soothing heartbeat. But uh, the fact that we looped it meant that every few minutes the sound would stop just a little, just long enough that you thought maybe it was over. Uh, <laughs> and then it starts again. Um, and this works really well. Like you feel the tension build throughout the game, just not not just with the characters, with the players and the opponent. And you don't actually even have to take my word for it because I asked one of the players uh, for ideas for slides, and these are the slides he sent me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess like my final words are if you want to drag your players through hell, don't just use sound, use continuous, irregular sound that they can't get used to. <laughs> Thank you. I'm guessing we should stop this again. <laughs> So next up is a joint presentation between uh, Maria Peterson and uh, Riyad Mustafa um, talking about the press uh, mechanic from Halat Hissar. Yes, hello. Uh, Halat Hissar was a Palestinian Finnish game played uh, first time in 2013 and second time last summer. Uh, the fiction <coughs> took place in occupied Finnish territories, which in many ways uh, were the situation there where it was similar to the occupied Palestinian territories of today. Um, the media presence, social media, and how things are portrayed <coughs> in foreign media play a role in Palestine. And, uh, that's why we wanted to portray that in the game as well. So this is a Twitter wall, of which we will talk later. And this is a media wall. 
Uh, Media World was actually developed during the game, the first game, uh, and it had headlines from different newspapers, news agencies, <coughs> and channels. They were produced both by uh, players who played journalists and the uh, organizers as well. And as the, there are differences between how different papers and journals and news agencies report about Palestine, uh, that was what we wanted to do as well. So when during a demonstration a UDF, Uralian Defense Force soldier, uh, shoots an unarmed Finnish um, protester, student, which has happened in Palestine as well, uh, the Finnish paper would say UDF soldier shoots Finnish um, student to death. The Uralian paper the occupied, from the occupied forces uh, would say Finnish terrorist attacks and UDF soldier. And the CNN would say suspected Finnish terrorist gets shot in Helsinki. And this added uh, a layer to the fiction. Often things happening in the game do, um, well, they have little or no effect on the larger fictional universe. Whereas here, the universe sort of called back. And um, the Twitter wall was something developed by the players themselves. So when they saw the media wall, they also wanted to do something and they started tweeting, which was a surprise to us. But it worked uh, very well and that's why we had it in the second game as a design element. So um, people tweeted, um, you could do it in actual Twitter, but then you, everybody would need have to have Twitter accounts, uh, phones suitable for tweeting and then in this way, it was actually social. People gathered there to, to watch the tweets and tweet themselves, not everybody sitting in their own corners with their phones. <laughs> so bringing social back to social media. <laughs> um, yes, and there also the organizers tweeted, for example, we took the actual tweets from the IDF, Israeli Defense Force account, and just put them as the UDF tweets, so they were presentative enough so we could use them as um, just to change, uh, after changing the, mm -hmm. the actual uh, tweeting. Yeah, thank you Maria. Uh, <clears throat> after the first game we uh, tried in the second game to, to give it an, another angle, so we had more uh, reports, TV reports, and we put a big screen and there was a team that working to bring the, rep uh, the reports, live reports, from the uh, actual places what, what the, uh, happened. So we have reporters, CNN reporters and BBC reporters that give the uh, Uralian uh, view of uh, the situation and the local uh, uh, TV reporter that gives uh, the, uh, the local story. So we can see that these reports that we put it after the scenes, live in the TV, the big screen, in the big hall, bring and, and new uh, emotions and new things for the players to play. So people, okay, we didn't see what happened, they will go to the media TV, uh, TV and they uh, saw the, the action, and after what they saw, they uh, do a, a new reaction. An interview with the military uh, soldier, we, we can see it there. So uh, really, the players, we had uh, three players that had cameras, and they report all these things and bring it uh, to us and we put it as it's live TV, it it's, it's gave a wonderful uh, game. And uh, to, t to tell you the truth, three times during the game, they came to me and asked me, shut down or we will broke the TV that we are looking at. Because the emotions are really high because you can see what happened there uh, actually in uh, the, uh, the TV. And after the game in the survey made by Markus Montola of the, of the second run, 67% of the players said that after the game they now read the news from Palestine different than they did before. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to the very end. Thank you all for coming.
Um, please, speakers, if you could hang out here for a while for all the questions, if there are any. And uh, thank you all for showing up, and thanks, speakers, for contributing.